The poem we're dealing with in this presentation is Nobody Loses All the Time by a poet called Edwin Estland Cummings or E.E. E. Cummings. You'll notice that E.E. E. Cummings' name is spelt without capitals, and this is one of the things that characterizes all of E.E. E. Cummings' poems, is his lack of use of punctuation and capitalization. This is because E.E. E. Cummings was one of the modernist poets. He was something of a nonconformist, and all of the, in this particular time period, the, the poets and the writers and the artists of this particular time period were all of a, a group of people who were moving away from traditional forms of art and expression and were looking for new ways of expressing themselves. So the poets in particular dispensed with those very rigid poetic structures of things like sonnets, and they just wrote freely. Um, in, they just embraced a little bit more of a chaotic form. And for us, it's, it's you know, these days, it's become something quite normal to just write in free verse. But at the time, that was, that was quite a departure. These were, these were sort of like poet rebels. This particular poem is not the, the most unstructured of E.E. E. Cummings' poems, and it's certainly not the, not the, the, the hardest one to understand because it has quite a, quite a simple language, which not all of his poems do. But this one is a, is a very good example of another aspect of the, of the time that he was writing in, and that's imagism. The, the imagists sought to create something new by isolating the meaning in, in, in simple things and just looking at things for what they were instead of making them unnecessarily complicated. So they would reduce poetry down. One poet, Ezra Pound in particular, would write these incredibly long poems and then progressively reduce them down and down and down into just a couple of phrases, you know, or just a couple of words because they sought to, to distill pure meaning. Now this poem, although it is a slightly longer poem, almost does the same thing because all that it is is a little snapshot of a, of a particular person in a, in a particular time and place. And it doesn't do anything except create this picture for you, this image for you. And that possibly in the hopes that whatever meaning you derived from it is contained in that image and doesn't have to be explained or shoved down your throat. It just exists for its own sake. The way in which the poem creates the image is to tell you a story. So it's a narrative poem. And like some of the other poems that we've got here, uh, the, the voice of the poet is not the narrative voice of the poem. So the poet's writing this poem, but he's actually, he's created a narrator who's telling you this little story. The poem is about the uncle of the narrator. And the narrator in this story uh, is maybe a little bit of a parody of a certain kind of person, namely a slightly uneducated southerner from the United States. Uh, that is the, the time in which uh, E. Cummings might have been writing and he had experience of that particular time and place when he was writing. So you've got this guy, Uncle Sol, who is himself a bit of a parody, but you're also going to hear that the person telling you about Uncle Sol has... A, a particular narrative voice that is also a bit of a parody. So just imagine the kind of person who would be sitting on a porch, you know, those sort of old fashioned American farmhouses with a piece of straw hanging out their mouth, you know, on a rocking chair, narrating this, you know, telling you this seemingly irrelevant anecdote about their uncle's soul. That's the kind of voice that's being created. And we'll see, I'll, I'll explain exactly how the poet creates that voice through through the diction of the, of the poem. But let's take a, a listen to the poem. Nobody loses all the time. I had an uncle named Saul who was a born failure and nearly everybody said he should have gone into vaudeville perhaps because my uncle Saul could sing McCann he was a diver on Xmas Eve like hell itself which may or may not account for the fact that my uncle Saul indulged in that possibly most inexcusable of all, to use a highfalutin phrase, luxuries, that is, or to wit, farming. And be it needlessly added, my Uncle Sol's farm failed because the chickens ate the vegetables. So my Uncle Sol had a chicken farm till the skunks ate the chickens when my Uncle Sol had a skunk farm. But the skunks caught cold and died. And so my Uncle Sol imitated the skunks in a subtle manner or by drowning himself in the water tank. But somebody who'd given my Uncle Sol a Victor Victrola and records while he lived 
presented to him upon the auspicious occasion of his decease, a scrumptious, not to mention splendiferous funeral, with tall boys and black gloves and flowers and everything. And I remember we all cried like the Missouri when my Uncle Saul's coffin lurched because somebody pressed a button and down went my Uncle Saul and started a worm farm. So do you see the, that the diction generates this very chatty conversational voice? Uh, it's quite informal. The person uses a lot of unnecessary phrases. You could call it garrulous or loquacious. Those are both really nice words used to describe somebody who talks too much, even a little bit verbose. They use words that are big words to make them sound impressive, but they might not necessarily understand what those words mean. And there's, the, there's some examples of, of all of the phrases that they use that are, are not really necessary. I'm going to go into it in a little bit more detail when we, when we analyze the, the poem verse by verse. And you'll see that you can almost take out a whole, almost half the verse, and you still have the, the story. It's just that it's been amplified by a whole lot of other unnecessary stuff. And this, this, all of this unnecessary wordage and verbiage is what also creates the tone, the, the humorous, light-hearted kind of tone. You know that you're going to hear a story because the poem starts with this, I had an uncle, and you know that you're, you're about to hear the story of the uncle. And it's, it's quite a funny story about an uncle who isn't a really good farmer. Um, but do you see how the, it shifts to a slightly darker tone towards the end? Still funny, but much darker humor because the humor lies in the fact that even when he died, um, he... He kind of was still farming, and, and that's that's a slightly darker humor, a slight, a slight shift in tone from the very lighthearted through to a little bit of dry wit and a little bit of dark humor at the end. So let's let's just go through the poem the way we usually do, verse by verse, stanza by stanza, and unpack whatever meaning we can from that. The first line of the poem is the point that the narrator wants to make with their story. So they, they say nobody loses all the time, which is an example of something called an aphorism or an adage. All it is is just a kind of an observation about life that just expresses a general truth about life, something like it can't rain all the time or, you know, after sunshine comes rain or what after rain comes sunshine, those sorts of um, truisms that people just kind of spit out. And you know that once the person said that, they're then going to go on to tell you a story that proves this, this little proverb that, they, that they've said. And, and so it starts with the story of Uncle Sol. Sol incidentally means son. And so you could derive a range of interpretations from that. You know, did he have a particularly sunny disposition? Was he a cheerful kind of character? Um, you know, maybe he wasn't as bad a guy as they all said he was. Son is, is a life-giving sort of thing. So, you know, maybe he was the life and soul of, of the party sort of thing or, or of the family, uh, you, can, you can take whatever you want to from the idea that his name was Sol. I've seen some interpretations suggest that this narrator and that this character might also have been Jewish and that that's why he's called Uncle Sol. So I have heard some narrations that are done with a, a sort of a, um, a Jewish voice and, and that might also be one of the interpretations. It starts by saying he was a born failure. So we know straight away that they're setting this poor chap up. You're going to hear a story of some terrible thing that he did. And nearly everybody said he should have gone into vaudeville. The, the, the qualification of nearly is also part of the humor because he's not even that successful that everybody would think that he should go into vaudeville. There's obviously a couple of people that think that he shouldn't. Vaudeville is a kind of entertainment. Well, it was a kind of entertainment. We don't see it much anymore. I think probably the equivalent of vaudeville for us might be something like X Factor or America's Got Talent or Idols, that sort of thing, where there is some skill involved, there's a bit of singing, there's a bit of dancing, but there's also people laughing at the misfortunes of the, of the, the, the characters and the performers. So vaudeville was a, a, a group of different people doing different things, a bit of comedy, a bit of song and dance. It was very popular, but it was kind of, you know, maybe a little bit of low-class entertainment. It wasn't something fancy like the opera or the theater. It was, it was multi-low-class entertainment because part of vaudeville was laughing at the people making a fool of themselves. 
But the interesting thing that is notable here about vaudeville is that it was originally a comedy that didn't have any psychological or moral intentions. It didn't try to prove a point or to prove a, that like what the moral of the story was. It was just a good laugh. And that's almost what this poem is. Maybe there's no actual moral intention in this poem. Maybe there's no deeper meaning. It's just a story being told for a laugh. And so there's a there's sort of two layers of humor going on here in the poem that it refers to this idea of vaudeville on the one hand as just being something simple while also maybe referring to something else. The the title of the poem, that McCanny was a driver, it's just the, the name of a song, in, in case you're wondering. It does sound a little bit strange. I mean, I don't know what song it was. I couldn't find any reference to it anywhere. It was obviously a popular song at the time. And this is the reason why people think that Uncle Sol should have gone into vaudeville, because obviously every now and then, specifically on Christmas Eve, he belts the song out. Now, there's a bit of humor in that too, because just think about it. If you're singing at Christmas time, chances are he was probably a little bit drunk or he was probably feeling in festive spirits. So here you've got a chap who every now and then can kind of belt out a song, and that has led some people to suggest that he should go into vaudeville. But what the result of that is, so the result of all of these people suggesting to him that he goes into vaudeville, obviously causes him to develop pretensions of grandeur because it's that, it's the fact that nearly everybody said he should have gone into vaudeville, which may or may not account for the fact that he then started farming. Now just think about that for a second. Some people said that he sang well, like, oh, Sol, you can really sing well, you should go into vaudeville. And so he decides to farm. That doesn't really add up either, does it? But that's also part of the humor of the poem. Now I'll unpack this stanza a little bit more as we go along, but you can see in this particular stanza that you've got a whole lot of unnecessary words here. One of which is this lovely word, highfalutin. Highfalutin is, a, is Southern slang. It means pompous or pretentious. So you've got the speaker saying, you know, to use a highfalutin phrase, that the, the person is actually kind of poking fun of themselves. I'm saying that I'm being pompous and pretentious. And look at all the additional extra words that you don't need over there. That is to wit, be it needlessly added. That garrulousness is what creates the, the chatty tone. It's just like a person telling a story. The phrase that is, is exactly the same phrase as to wit. To wit means that is. They both mean you know, i.e., they demonstrate, they're pointing towards something. And actually, both of those phrases are unnecessary too. Just as unnecessary as the other phrase, be it needlessly added, which is even more ironic because here you've got somebody saying, you know, I don't need to tell you that, and then they go ahead and tell you. Or I, I, need, I, I needn't add that, and then they do add that. That's where the humor is because you've got a person saying something that they don't need to say, and then they're going ahead and saying it anyway. Look at what that stanza would, would sound like if you took out all of those unnecessary words. It probably makes a lot more sense. So what you have then is some people told him that he should go into vaudeville, which may account for the fact that my Uncle Sol indulged in that inexcusable luxury farming and my Uncle Sol's farm failed. That's, that's all of the, if you, if you remove all of the unnecessary information, you can see what, what it's actually saying there. Uncle Sol thought he was great. He went into farming. The farming didn't work. Just a note on style and structure here. As I said to you before, this is not one of E. Cummings' most unstructured poems, but it's still complete free verse. Unstructured, unpunctuated, lots of enjambment. You should know what enjambment is by now, but if you don't, enjambment is when a line, a sentence gets split at some point and runs on onto the next line of poetry. So an example of enjambment would be in the third line over here, soul indulged in that most inexcusable of all. The inexcusable of all is where the enjambment takes place. It's, it's cut the sentence in the middle over there. The disorganized structure not only kind of contributes towards the conversational style, but it also mirrors how disorganized Uncle Sol is. It echoes natural speech patterns and it echoes the kind of person that, that he might be, which is also you know, quite lighthearted and humorous. In this stanza, we see why he was such a failure. 
he didn't manage to farm any of the things that he set out to farm. Obviously, he meant to farm vegetables, but the chickens must have got into the vegetable patch somehow. They probably ate all of the seeds. And so he had a chicken farm. The, the implication here is that he didn't intend to farm chickens. The chicken farming was accidental. He intended to farm vegetables, but he screwed that up. And then he ended up with a chicken farm. And he, and, he, and he messed up that too, because the skunks came along and they ate the chickens. Now there's humor in that because nobody would possibly want a skunk farm. Skunks wouldn't be used for anything at all. So the fact that he had a skunk farm is in itself funny. And that humor is compounded by the fact that he even failed at that. He couldn't even keep the skunks from dying and the skunks caught cold and died. So that's just sort of humor on humor and just demonstrates to us exactly all of the ways in which he failed at being, being a farmer. And here we have a much denser verse. Just look at that verse. If you compare this particular verse here, just look at the structure of that verse and go back to the previous verse, which is far more sparse. Now you've got a much more densely packed verse, which is in itself part of the lesson that you've got here. They've glossed over his entire life in the poem. So this narrator has kind of summarized his life very briefly and is now going to spend a lot more time telling you about his death. There's a lot more information about this particular stanza, which talks about his death, than there was in all of the previous stanzas which talked about his life. And if you look at the structure of the stanza, can you see that it kind of starts with short sentences, they get longer and longer and longer, and then they become shorter again. It's almost like a shape poem in a way. It's almost like him kind of starting small, growing bigger, and then getting small again and dying. It's like a timeline. So now we see that, okay, the skunks are dead, and Uncle Sol has imitated the skunks by also dying. The narrator suggests that it's, he imitated them in a subtle manner, but of course that's deeply ironic because there's nothing subtle about killing yourself, which is what he did. He drowned himself in the water tank, which is not a very glamorous way to die at all, is it? But, and here we have the big but. So he's failed all of his life, the skunks died. He imitated the skunks by drowning himself in the water tank. But somebody who'd given my uncle Sol a Victor Victrola and records while he lived presented to him, upon the auspicious occasion of his decease, a scrumptious funeral. So let's look at that. Let's just unpack it a little bit. The Victor Victrola is that picture there, that wind up gramophone player. So somebody who knew Uncle Sol had given him this gift. Now, this must have been a good friend of his, surely, or somebody that liked him enough to give him that. Not only that, but when Uncle Sol died, this person threw a massive funeral for him. Look at, the, look at the kind of funeral that he got. Now, first of all, there's a little bit more irony here because the narrator refers to the auspicious occasion of his decease. Auspicious means fortunate or lucky. And there, obviously, there can't be anything lucky about dying. It is lucky for the narrator because the narrator is about to tell you why it was better that he died, which is not very nice. But it's deeply ironic that the narrator would suggest that his death was an auspicious occasion for him. But this person presented to him this fantastic funeral. Again, look at the use of words here. Uh, look at the diction. He presented a scrumptious, not to mention splendiferous funeral. Scrumptious is the wrong word there. Scrumptious means tasty. There's an example of this narrator using an incorrect word just to sound fancy and just to sound impressive. And splendiferous is an unnecessarily complicated word. I mean, even that would have been a, a big word to be using. Can you, can, you, can you hear the voice of the narrator coming through in the story all the way along? And it was a wonderful funeral. There were tall boys in black gloves. Those are the attendants. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the funeral dancer meme. That's the kind of funeral that this would have this would have been, okay? There's people in black gloves, flowers, everything. And they all cried like the Missouri. The Missouri is a big river in the in the southern United States. So they were all terribly upset and they cried when somebody pushed the button and Uncle Sol lurched and and went down into the earth. Now, look at that word, lurched, that particular verb. 
it's not smooth, is it? There was kind of like a bit of a shake. Can you see that you might almost have expected something terrible to happen here? I mean, we know Uncle Sol is a born failure. So it's almost as if we might expect the coffin to fall or it to, you know, crack open or something like that. But fortunately, it doesn't happen. So, so the use of the word lurched almost builds up a little bit of tension. And then the tension is, is relieved because somebody pressed a button and down went my uncle Sol and started a worm farm. Now look at the use of the brackets here. This is a very characteristic E.E. E. Cummings thing, but it also generates more irony. Why would that last sentence be in brackets? It makes it seem like an afterthought, doesn't it? That the, kind, that the person just sort of added it at the end. But actually, it's not an afterthought. It's the punchline of the entire story. Because we've got now the narrator finally explaining why nobody loses all the time. He doesn't lose anymore at the, at the point of his death. This is the whole point of the story. The significance of this whole life of Uncle Sol is to prove that even though he lost the whole way through his life, his funeral was a fantastic affair and finally he was successful. But he was only successful after he died. Deeply ironic, because his body creates, successfully created a worm farm. So by the time you get to the end of the story, what you're left is a story that's just one level of irony on top of another. Because although on the one hand, the narrator is telling you a, an ironic story about the fact that nobody loses all the time, and Uncle Sol finally succeeded at something once he had died, if we read between the lines, and if we look back at all of the things that we know about Uncle Sol from this poem, we might be able to see that he wasn't actually that much of a failure. I mean, he must have been quite a lot of fun. People are talking about the fact that he should have gone into vaudeville. He must have been like a fun kind of singer. Seems like a, a fun kind of guy. And then we get to this funeral where someone who obviously really liked him because they gave him this, this gift when he was alive, goes so far as to pay for this extravagant funeral for him. Why would somebody go to the trouble of creating this, this, this massive funeral for somebody who was a born failure? And if he was such a born failure, why was everybody so sad? Why did they all cry like the Missouri? Actually, if you look past what the narrator is telling you here, which is in itself one level of irony, you come to the realization that Uncle Sol wasn't a born failure. And so then the title, um, Nobody Loses All the Time, takes on a slightly different meaning, doesn't it, in the context of the fact that while the narrator is trying to say that he finally won when he died, actually we see that he didn't lose all of the time. <laughs>